Difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. So I was driven by a passion that was bigger than the show in the beginning. And I believe that in order to continue, every person has a responsibility to use their life. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men and men all my life. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more. And you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Oprah Winfrey, and my take on her top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Have a vision. I managed to get here. Stedman and I have absolutely uh, differing philosophies because he um, teaches um, the idea of, he has a book called, uh, not, yeah, what is a book called? <laughs> the book is called, You Can Make It Happen, Nine Steps to Success. And he's always um, talking to me about cre having a vision that with, with no vision, the people perish. And I always say, oh, I didn't have a vision. I didn't have a vision to get here to where I am. My vision was uh, surrendering to what I believe is, was God's vision for me. And I always say, God can dream a bigger dream for you than you can dream for yourself. Mm -hmm. I now believe that I need a vision. I think Stedman is finally right that uh, in order to continue to move forward, that I need to develop a vision for myself. And um, one of my big goals is to use this television show as a forum and a catalyst for change in people's lives. That's one of them. Yes. The other is to move out into the world in a, a more... Um, uh, impactful global format to help women and children across the globe. Without education, the people perish. Without education, nobody will be able to survive. Without education, women cannot overcome poverty, will not be able to learn to take care of themselves, will not be able to move forward on the planet. So I wanna use my life and this television show to continue to do that. Rule number two, value people. You find that behind the facade of all of your opinions and your beliefs, that at the heart of us, we all want the same thing. I want the same thing that you want. And I know that whether you are Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or whatever you call yourself, that underneath every body is this desire and need to be valued and to know that what you say, what you think, what you want to do in the world, your fullest expression of yourself, that that thing matters. Rule number three, use your voice. I think some people think that, are under the impression that I was born empowered, that I was born uh, coming out of the womb, ready to interview a Klansman. <laughs> then cut to commercial, we'll be right back. But the truth is, I know very well what it's like to be marginalized, to be told either subtly or quite directly that my contribution isn't or wasn't welcome, that my face was invisible, and that my needs were an affront. So back when I was doing the news in Baltimore, I asked to be paid the same as my co-anchor who did exactly the same job as I was doing. And I expected that I would be compensated. So I went in and I asked that I would get the same amount of money. So he was doing the same job I was doing except that he called me babe all the time. Babe, yeah babe. Anyway, I was told by my news director and by the general manager, because first I went to the news director, then I went to general manager, and I was told that because I was a single woman who didn't have a mortgage and I didn't have kids, that I was not entitled to earn the same kind of money as the man who was sitting next to me doing the same thing. And I realized in that moment that my employers did not get it. They did not understand my value. But you know what? I did. So cut to AM Chicago. The team's hard at work and they had been working for a long time. And after a year or so, we were asked to be syndicated. That work began to pay off. And before long, we were now no longer called AM Chicago, we're the National Oprah Winfrey Show. 
I got a raise. This is before I owned myself. So, <laughs> I got a raise, but my producers did not. So I went into the boss at the time, and I asked that my producers, who incidentally were all female, I asked that they would be given a pay raise increase. And my boss, this is in 1986, said, why? They're only girls. What do they need more money for? Girls. Uh, I've used the word affectionately sometimes, referring to women as girls, and there was no affection in his tone. It was absolutely condescending. So, uh, you know, it takes a while to develop a voice, but once you have it, you damn sure better use it on stuff that matters. So I took a deep breath in that moment and said, either they're gonna get raises or I'm gonna sit down. I'm not gonna work if they don't get paid more, babe. <laughs> now, I would like to believe that I could have spoken that kind of truth to misogyny even if I'd been all by myself. But here I was, on the brink of finally getting what I really wanted and had been working uh, many years for, a national show. I mean, I might have been too intimidated to stand my own ground against this guy if I were actually alone. But here's the thing, you're never alone. You're never alone. The sovereign sound of Maya Angelou's voice was pushing me forward that day, whispering, I come as one but I stand as 10,000. So when I was faced with the opportunity to advocate for my producers, I silently called on some of the 10,000 and walked into my boss's office, hand in spirit with the women who had come before me. I could feel Bessie Smith and Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald and Pearl Bailey and Sarah Vaughn and Lena Horn clutching their green books looking for a place to eat while they sang in supper clubs for whites only. And I could feel Reese Taylor and Rosa Parks refusing to relinquish their dignity in the face of death threats. All these women were with me that day walking into the office in Chicago, as was Diana Carroll and Petula Clark and Joan Baez, and Mary Tyler Moore, and Moms Mabley, and Barbara Walters, and all of the astonishing women whose names none of us will ever even know, despite their sacrifice. And I'm pretty sure I even heard Shirley Chisholm urging me on with this thought. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And I understood, I understood that there were so many times that many women from my mother's generation and God knows my grandmother's generation who were forced to grit their teeth and just take it because standing up for themselves wasn't even an option. The risk was too great and they knew it. But they also knew in their bones what my dear friend Maya put so eloquently into words when she says, you may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Because these women and so many others like them made the decision not to allow themselves to be reduced by the many injustices they were subjected to, I found the strength to act, if not just for myself, not just for my producers, but for all the women who in their ingenious ways subverted the rules, laid the foundation, and pushed the envelope just a little bit further for me. Rule number four, have empathy. I know exactly the moment I started to feel valued, and for me, it was school. I wanted to be a fourth grade teacher because of Mrs. Duncan, and I haven't seen Mrs. Duncan since then, and Mrs. Duncan is here today. <laughs> The moment I felt the most value was in my fourth grade class when Mrs. Duncan said to me, 
I, I was the one who was chosen to lead the class and whatever it was. So what was that like? I don't, I don't really remember. Oh, I do remember you. That I was... remember you were such a fluent reader. Well, oh, if I had had a class full of students like Oprah, I would have been floating on air. So Mrs. Duncan instilled in me this sense of believing that I mattered. And that is what every human being is looking for. When you first heard that I had like done something in, in life, were, oh, did you know that it was me? I, yes, mm -hmm. I kept it with you without your being aware of it. And it was Mrs. Duncan who helped heal you? For me, yes. It was Mrs. Duncan, and then it was my, my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Graham. It was school that made me feel a sense of value and connection. You learned a lot on this story. Oh, I learned a lot on this story. This story was life-changing for me. Life-changing, really? Life-changing. And people use that word rhetorically. Mm -hmm. Life-changing. It's changed the way I operate with, in my business, with my people, with my school. One, two, three, yay! You say that the most important question to ask of people who have gone through trauma is not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. Yeah. 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 So when you see you know, a church being shot up, or you see, you know, all of the headline-making uh, stories of people seemingly gone mad, mm. your first thought is, what happened to that person? Right. Right. You know, what has been life-changing for me um, is the question, what happened to you? Not what is wrong with you, but what happened to you? Which is an important question, not just for people who have been so-called traumatized, but it's the most important question you can ask of anyone. I can say that of all the stories I've ever done in my life and all of the experiences I've ever had and people I've interviewed, this story has had more impact on me than practically anything I've ever done. It's changed the way you see everyone? It's changed the way I see everyone. So when I have an employee who is acting out of line or who is just being a jerk, I don't think, what's wrong with that guy? What's wrong with that girl? What's wrong with that person? I think, I wonder what happened to them. Hmm. I wonder what happened to them. I wonder what happened that caused them to behave that way. That's what this story did for me. Also, if you want to have more self-confidence and self-belief, the science says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action for the habit to stick. And that's what I want for you. So I've designed a custom free program where I'm gonna send you an unlisted video for the next 254 days to shift your confidence and belief forward. The link to join is in the description below. Figure out where your power base is. Your number one job is to become more of yourself and to grow yourself into the best of yourself. Become so skilled, so vigilant, so flat out fantastic at what you do, that your talent cannot be dismissed. Rule number five, be passion driven. For me, I've already made more money than I expected. I've already got more shoes than I know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what to do with the shoes? And you know, so, and it never was about material possessions. I don't think if I could have, um, if I'd sat down and said, how do I dream myself up to be able to get all this? I wouldn't have known how to do it. So I was driven by a passion that was bigger than the show in the beginning. And I believe that in order to continue, every person has a responsibility to use their life. You, everybody who came here today, your life may not be as big as mine, meaning not as many people know you. And the only difference between being famous and not is that more people know your name. The real reality is what uh, Billy was singing and what um, Maddie talks about in his poetry is that we are really all alike, yeah. except for our hair. We are really, <laughs> we are really all alike. Yeah. And that has been one of the greatest lessons I've learned in doing this television show, is that what everybody is looking for is validation. Yeah. In every experience, people are looking to know that they matter, that you matter, that I matter. In every encounter, in all of your fights at home, all your arguments with your boss or with your children, with your husband, when you really peel back the layers and get down to what is, what is this? What are we arguing about? You argue, you want to say, I matter. And I think that um, um, what we've been able to do on this show is to help people see that for themselves 
And if I can be able to give that back to people in a way that makes them matter to themselves, then this is worth billions of dollars. Billions. It's priceless. It's priceless to be able to do that. Rule number six, get the lesson from failure. Nobody's journey is seamless or smooth. We all stumble, we all have setbacks. If things go wrong, you hit a dead end, as you will. It's just life's way of saying, time to change course. So ask every failure, this is what I do. Every failure, every crisis, every difficult time, I say, what is this here to teach me? And as soon as you get the lesson, you get to move on. If you really get the lesson, you pass and you don't have to repeat the class. If you don't get the lesson, it shows up wearing another pair of pants or skirt to give you some remedial work. And what I found is that difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper because life always whispers to you first. first and if you ignore the whisper sooner or later, you'll get a scream. Whatever you resist persists, but if you ask the right question, not why is this happening, but what is this here to teach me? What is this here to teach me? It puts you in the place and space to get the lesson you need. My friend Eckhart Tolle, uh, who's written this wonderful book uh, called A New Earth, that's all about letting the awareness of who you are stimulate everything that you do. He puts it like this, he says, don't react against a bad situation, merge with that situation instead, and the solution will arise from the challenge. Because surrendering yourself doesn't mean giving up, it means acting with responsibility. Okay, many of you know that, as President Hennessy said, I started this school in Africa. And I founded the school where I'm trying to give South African girls a shot at a future like yours, Stanford. And I spent five years making sure that school would be as beautiful as the students. I wanted every girl to feel her worth reflected in her surroundings. So I checked every blueprint, I picked every pillow, I was looking at the grout in between the bricks, I knew every thread count of the sheets, I chose every girl from the villages, from nine provinces, and yet, last fall, I was faced with a crisis I'd never anticipated. I was told that one of the dorm matrons was suspected of sexual abuse. Well, that was, as you can imagine, devastating news. First I cried, actually I sobbed, for about a half an hour, and then I said, let's get to it. That's all you get, is a half an hour. You need to focus on the now, what you need to do now. So I contacted a child trauma specialist, I put together a team of investigators, I made sure the girls had counseling and support, and Gail and I got on a plane and flew to South Africa. And the whole time I kept asking that question, what is this here to teach me? And as difficult as that experience has been, I got a lot of lessons. I understand now the mistakes I made because I had been paying attention to all of the wrong things. I built that school from the outside in when what really mattered was the inside out. So it's a lesson that applies to all of our lives as a whole. What matters most is what's inside. What matters most is the sense of integrity, of quality, and beauty. I got that lesson. And what I know is, is that the girls came away with something too. They've emerged from this more resilient and knowing that their voices have power. Rule number seven, use a vision board. Before we came here, Deepak Chopra, great thought leader of our times. I had called him wanting to do an interview with him and he said he was going to be coming to India. And I, I, I have a vision board, I keep a vision mm -hmm. board. First vision board ever, ever started was to get Barack Obama elected. So I just had Barack Obama. And then I went back and that vision board was right by my, in my bathroom by the bathtub. So every morning I would say, Barack Obama president, Barack Obama president. <laughs> And then, uh, this is in 2007, and then I decided I had to go back and put 2008 so that whoever was listening would know I didn't mean Barack Obama president 2012 or 2016. So I only had that as a vision. And then I put a picture, after Barack Obama won, I put a picture I cut out of a magazine of a woman 
on a camel in, and it said, come to India. Come to India. And I've held that as my vision on my vision board for the past three years. So when this idea of coming with Deepak, mm -hmm. I went, now it's time to fulfill the vision. So first impression, coming in the city, chaotic, and then being in the city with more people than I've ever encountered in my <laughs> life. But still feeling not a sense of being unsafe. Rule number eight, be consistent. We all are here to fulfill the dreams of those who came before us. Maya used to say, you've been paid for. You've been paid for, young people, so put your crown on your head and wear it. We are here not merely to bear witness, but to be the new voices of an extraordinary new age. You see, when I was growing up, there were no black people in the media, just buckwheat, uh, <laughs> on television. And I was constantly doing that thing, looking to find myself. And what I found and said was, leave it to Beaver and Donna Reed and Lassie, although technically I guess Lassie was mostly brown. The, 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 the point is though, we are now able to see ourselves reflected through entertainment. But what pleases me most is that we're beginning to see on screen, what we're beginning to see is starting to change the landscape of what we see behind the scenes. What Kamal was talking about, true inclusion. And what I realized during all those years during the Oprah show, and the reason that OWN is now thriving, is how essential it is to see yourself reflected in other people's stories. It's something that you, as white people, never have to even think about. Because the more you see a broader and richer and more nuanced depiction of yourself and your neighbor and the world, the more empowered you become. And it's that sense of empowerment that actually tethers us to the universe. It gives us at least a glimpse of how connected we all are. So what a blessed sign of progress it is to know that millions of kids in 2019 don't have to stand with their noses pressed up against the window or the television screens looking in at a family that makes them feel less than by comparison. Today we can point to work that says you are every bit as valued and vital to the fabric of life as anyone else. You are a part of a community. But it takes time. It takes time to see yourself. It takes time to hear yourself and to feel, to feel appreciated for just being yourself. Empowerment does not happen overnight. Like change, it is never just one thing. It is a series of consistent steps, great and small, that proves to us again and again that genuine change is actually possible. Rule number nine, live in the moment. Gwendolyn Brooks wrote a poem for her children. It's called Speech to the Young, Speech to the Progress Toward. And she says at the end, live not for battles won, live not for the end of the song, live in the along. She's saying, like Eckhart Tolle, that you have to live for the present, you have to be in the moment. Whatever has happened to you in your past has no power over this present moment because life is now. But I think she's also saying, be a part of something. Don't live for yourself alone. This, uh, this is what I know for sure. In order to be truly happy, you must live along with and you have to stand for something larger than yourself because life is a reciprocal exchange. To move forward, you have to give back. And to me, that is the greatest lesson of life. To be happy, you have to give something back. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is have fun. Thank you. 
hostess was billionaire socialite Parmeshwar Godrich. It's an honor to be honored by you. Long time of you. What an honor to be honored by you. Thank you. Parmeshwar and her husband, Adi, are among the richest in the country, worth nearly $7 billion, I'm told. They hold a place at the top of the Mumbai social scene. Everyone was at their house, including A.R. Rahman. Oh, my gosh. Time magazine called the Oscar and Grammy winner the most popular film composer in the world. He sold over 300 million movie soundtracks. His music for the Oscar darling Slumdog Millionaire had everyone in America singing... The day after winning two Oscars, A.R. performed that song on the Oprah show. I promised him that one day I'd visit his homeland, India. I told you I was going to come. I don't think you really believed me. I didn't believe you. You didn't. How do you feel? I feel... I will have to tell you, there was a sense of exhilaration coming in the city, and it just felt like another world. And I was so happy to see all the women in the saris, because you immediately had... You look the, lovely. Well, thank you. Uh, the identification that it was, a, it was another place, another space. But the, the thing that's just really moving to me is the spirit. That's, what I, that's my biggest impression so far. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I want to know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through on your goals. 35%, that's not enough. That's not enough just to get motivated. Believe Nation, we're here, you're here. The today matters, you're an action taker. When you commit to a plan of action of when and how you're gonna follow through, when you write it down, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you commit publicly to somebody else, it jumps to 95% chance. From 30 something percent to 95% chance of you following through. Believe Nation, we need to make this happen. So question of the day, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action specific for the next week. Put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna show on screen sometime next week to celebrate. What about something that you feel like you've personally achieved or overcome? Is there something that you are especially proud of yourself for? Yeah, I'm uh, especially proud of myself for not uh, living in the world of comparisons. You know, uh, years ago when I pulled out that wagon of fat, I was actually comparing myself to everybody else or what I thought you're supposed to look like or mm -hmm. what size you're supposed to be. So I've now reached the point where I'm really okay exactly where I am. and. That's, you know, it's taken me a lifetime practically oh, to figure that out. And being, being okay exactly where you are. Because comparing is a dangerous thing. It's so thing. hard because we are in the world of insta comparison, mm -hmm. you know? And so the real spiritual practice is to like live from within and not let the world define who you are, but you do that for yourself. That's, that's the hardest work. I'm going to continue developing shows that speak uh, to the humanity of people in a way that makes them want to live better and do better and um, that it exalts their, their, their victories and lets them know that they are important and meaningful in the world. You know, I would have to say that every day, David, that show was such a, it was like therapy for me, kind of like now. Right. Uh, right. Uh, every day the show was, I paid attention. So I, I've never been to a therapist, but uh, I, I, I paid attention all those days on the show and I made therapy acceptable for a lot of people who thought, oh, not me, not. So one of the things I started to get uh, around mid to late, no, no, late, mid to late 90s is that everybody that I had on the show at the end of the show would say something to me like, um, was that okay? Was that okay? How was that? Was that okay? Right. At the end of the interview. And I started to then track it. It didn't matter if it was, um, I, 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 I had gone and done a show where I was in um, a prison. And I was interviewing a father who was in jail for life for murdering his twin daughters. And at the end of the interview, even behind bars, he said to me, is that okay? How'd right. I do? And Barack Obama said it when he sat in the chair the first time. And... George Bush said it, Beyonce said it at the end of her, she taught me how to twerk and then said, is that okay? Right, right, right. 
So that's an acquired skill, do they? Right? Yes, a working thing. But this is what I learned uh, sitting in that chair for 25 years. That at the end of the day, whether you are interviewing me or I get to interview you, whatever your profession is, wherever you are in your life, in your relationships, every person that you encounter, every experience, the person wants to know, was that okay? Was that okay? And what I started to hear was that what people are really saying is, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything right. to you? And so I started to listen with that in mind, with that intention of validating that your being here, your speaking to me, your taking the time to do this with me is important because you matter. And that's true for everybody who's watching or listening, that every argument that you ever have, every encounter, the person just wants to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did I say anything that happened? You- There's a bigger dream waiting for you, just waiting for you to step into it. To step into it. Your life is big. Your life is huge. And we spend so much time wanting to be in somebody else's life. And you don't get honored. You don't get revered. You don't get celebrating wanting what somebody else has. Because that which created you, divine intelligence that dreamed you from before your ancestors ever knew they would become your ancestors, that which dreamed the seed of you wants you to know how special, how wondrous, how mysterious, how complex, how glorious, how phenomenal you are. And you get no credit messing in somebody else's territory. Or trying to have power over something you have no control. Another one of my favorite teachings is the Wizard of Oz. When the Wicked Witch of the West says, go away from here because you don't have any power here, you have no power in any territory other than your own. Oh, but you are the master of that. You get to be the master of your own fate. You get to be the captain of your own soul. And if you just manage that, if you just took care of your territory, oh, the glorious, 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 wondrous, wondrous opportunities and possibilities that are waiting for you. So the question is, what are you resisting? What are you pushing against? What are you not allowing? What are you blocking? Because you have this idea of who and what you're supposed to be instead of leaning into the dream that's already been created and waiting for you. It's waiting for you. And the second, I mean, it doesn't, it's an instant thing. It's a shift in the way you see yourself and the power from which you have come. So the Angel Network, I've been on the air for a long time, but it was the Angel Network that actually focused my internal GPS. It helped me to decide that I wasn't just gonna be on TV every day, but that the goal of my shows, my interviews, my business, my philanthropy, all of it, whatever ventures I might pursue, would be to make clear that what unites us is ultimately far more redeeming and compelling than anything that separates me. Because what had become clear to me, and I want you to know it isn't always clear in the beginning, because as I said, I've been on television since I was 19 years old. But around 94, I got really clear. So don't expect the clarity to come all at once, to know your purpose right away. But what became clear to me was that I was here on earth to use television and not be used by it. To use television to illuminate the transcendent power of our better angels. So, This Angel Network, it didn't just change the lives of those who were helped, but the lives of those who also did the helping. 
It reminded us that no matter who we are or what we look like or what we may believe, it is both possible and more importantly, it, it becomes powerful to come together in common purpose and common effort. You will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself as a human being. You wanna max out your humanity by using your energy to lift yourself up, your family, and the people around you. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The world needs People like Michael Stalzenberg from Fort Lauderdale. When Michael was just eight years old, Michael nearly died from a bacterial infection that cost him both of his hands and both of his feet. And in an instant, this vibrant little boy became a quadruple amputee, and his life was changed forever. But in losing who he once was, Michael discovered who he wanted to be. He refused to sit in that wheelchair all day and feel sorry for himself. So with prosthetics, he learned to walk and run and play again. He joined his middle school lacrosse team. And last month when he learned that so many victims of the Boston Marathon bombing would become new amputees, Michael decided to banish that darkness with light. Michael and his brother Harris created Mikey'sRun.com to raise $1 million for other amputees by the time Harris runs the 2014 Boston Marathon. More than a thousand miles away from here, these two young brothers are bringing people together to support this Boston community the way their community came together to support Michael. And when this 13-year-old man was asked about his fellow amputees, he said this, first, they will be sad. They're losing something they will never get back. And that's scary. I was scared. But they'll be okay. They just don't know that yet. We might not always know it. We might not always see it or hear it on the news or even feel it in our daily lives. But I have faith that no matter what, Class of 2013, you will be okay. And you will make sure our country is okay. I have faith because of that nine-year-old girl who went out and collected the change. I have faith because of David and Francine Wheeler. I have faith because of Michael and Harris Stolzenberg. And I have faith because of you, the network of angels sitting here today. One of them, Khadija Williams, who came to Harvard four years ago. Khadija had attended 12 schools in 12 years, living out of garbage bags amongst pimps and prostitutes and drug dealers, homeless, going into department stores, Walmart in the morning to bathe herself so that she wouldn't smell in front of her classmates. And today she graduates as a member of the Harvard class of 2013. I had a job until I could figure out what it was really what that gave my life its purpose and meaning. And um, I, I'd gotten demoted in my job in Baltimore as an anchor woman because as they hired me and then they decided I was the wrong color and I was the wrong size and I was the wrong, you know, I had lots of problems and they were trying to take me off the air. And um, I was making $22,000 a year. I thought I was in heaven because I was making my age. And my dream at the time was, Gail and I used to say, can you imagine if you're 40 and you're making 40,000? Ooh, that'd be it. <laughs> so um, uh, that was as big as my dream was, just to make my age. And then I did this, they, they put me on a talk show one morning because um, they didn't know what to do with me. And, and I was interviewing the Carvel Ice Cream Man. It was a local talk show. And um, Benny from, um, Benny, who was Mrs. Chancellor's 
uh, butler or something on all my children. Anyway, my soap opera star who wasn't the lead star. Remember Benny? Yeah. Benny and the Carvel Ice Cream Men. That's how I cut my teeth. And I finished that show. So it's not about the, the, the stars themselves or whoever the guests were. But I felt like this is what I'm supposed to do. All these years I've been misplaced in news because I couldn't relate to news. I was a news reporter and I'd be out on the stories and I'd be crying with the people. <laughs> and I felt that I was exploiting the people with news. I couldn't, you know, put a microphone in people's face when they were going through tragedies and stuff. I just was so emotional. I was always getting little notes from my boss about, cut that out, you need to stop. So, but the moment I did that talk show, I felt like, oh, I can be myself. And that was uh, August 14th, 1978. And that was the beginning of fulfilling the calling. And so since that time, since that time, August 14th, 1978, I've never had a problem with energy. Now, when I was working in news, I used to be exhausted all the time. Ex just exhausted all the time because I hated it. And the reason I didn't quit is because I'm not a quitter, number one. And because my father was like, better not quit that job. You're making $22,000 a year. <laughs> Who's going to play a black woman for $22,000 a year? You're never going to make, th th make that kind of money again. You better save half of it. So... <laughs> I, I was reluctant to quit and think about doing something else because I thought, okay, everybody wants to be an anchor woman. At the time, that was like supposedly a big deal, being an anchor woman. So I thought, okay, I won't. I'll just stay with this until I can figure out what is the best thing to do. And interestingly enough, I was applying for what I wanted to do. I felt like I needed to be able to talk. And at the time, the only thing that was available was, um, was uh, like uh, Good Morning America, or the Today Show. So I called up this agent and I asked if he would accept my tape because I wanted to be like a substitute for Bryant Gumbel. And he said to me, there was only gonna be one Bryant Gumbel. And so there wasn't gonna be another one, that they weren't gonna let another black person on that show. He said that to me. And um, interestingly enough, he called me last week because somebody else mentioned his name to say he never said it, but he did say it. And I said to him, you know what? If you're ever told that, you never forget it. If somebody ever says to you, if you're ever rejected in that way, you never, ever, ever forget it. I said, but it's okay. I did okay. You did okay. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. But the answer to your question is, if you can find what is your passion, if you find what you love, you never get tired. Or if you do get tired, if you, you're fueled by the energy of your work. So I know that I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing at this time. I also know that what this, this show can do in terms of being um, a voice in changing the world, it's just the beginning of what this show can do. It's fun to do things like this, but, uh, and it's necessary to do things like this in order to be able to do the bigger, grander things, to change what happens to, to the face of children in Africa, for example, or what happens to education with kids in, in this country. So I believe that, um, that what has happened to me is really the beginning of the greater passion to come. But if you find out what you're supposed to do, and you know what you're supposed to do by how it, how it feels. You know, people wait on the voice of God to be some, the Moses in a burning bush. I think that was only Bible talk, you know, because he doesn't come to burning bushes for people. He comes <laughs> through your heart. He speaks through your heart, through your feelings. And so you know what, if you're doing the right thing, if it feels like it's right to you. And when you hit the thing that feels right, when you know it's the right thing, you, would, you know it's right because it gives you your juice and you know it's right because you would do it for nothing. You would do it for nothing and find a way to be able just to do it in order to be able to continue. That's how you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Nobody's journey is seamless or smooth. We all stumble, we all have setbacks. If things go wrong, you hit a dead end as you will. It's just life's way of saying, time to change course. So ask every failure, this is what I do. Every failure, every crisis, every difficult time, I say, what is this here to teach me? And as soon as you get the lesson, you get to move on. If you really get the lesson, you pass and you don't have to repeat the class. If you don't get the lesson, it shows up wearing another pair of pants or skirt to give you some remedial work. 
And what I found is that difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper because life always whispers to you first, first, and if you ignore the whisper sooner or later, you'll get a scream. Whatever you resist persists, but if you ask the right question, not why is this happening, but what is this here to teach me? What is this here to teach me? It puts you in the place and space to get the lesson you need. My friend Eckhart Tolle, uh, who's written this wonderful book uh, called A New Earth, it's all about letting the awareness of who you are stimulate everything that you do. He puts it like this. He says, don't react against a bad situation. Merge with that situation instead. And the solution will arise from the challenge. Because surrendering yourself doesn't mean giving up. It means acting with responsibility. Okay. Many of you know that, as President Hennessy said, I started this school in Africa. And I founded the school where I'm trying to give South African girls a shot at a future like yours, Stanford. And I spent five years making sure that school would be as beautiful as the students. I wanted every girl to feel her worth reflected in her surroundings. So I checked every blueprint, I picked every pillow, I was looking at the grout in between the bricks, I knew every thread count of the sheets, I chose every girl from the villages, from nine provinces, and yet, last fall, I was faced with a crisis I'd never anticipated. I was told that one of the dorm matrons was suspected of sexual abuse. Well, that was, as you can imagine, devastating news. First I cried, actually I sobbed, for about a half an hour, and then I said, let's get to it. That's all you get, is a half an hour. You need to focus on the now, what you need to do now. So I contacted a child trauma specialist, I put together a team of investigators, I made sure the girls had counseling and support, and Gail and I got on a plane and flew to South Africa. And the whole time I kept asking that question, what is this here to teach me? And as difficult as that experience has been, I got a lot of lessons. I understand now the mistakes I made because I had been paying attention to all of the wrong things. I built that school from the outside in when what really mattered was the inside out. So it's a lesson that applies to all of our lives as a whole. What matters most is what's inside. What matters most is the sense of integrity, of quality, and beauty. I got that lesson. And what I know is, is that the girls came away with something too. They've emerged from this more resilient and knowing that their voices have power. I did this at the end of my uh, sh uh, show. I did my favorite guest of all times. That's hard to do out of literally th thousands and thousands. They, they, they supposedly estimated lines. that there's like 35,000 people I interviewed over the years. But there was one woman out of all the celebrities, out of all of the famous, non-famous, infamous people. One woman who from was Zim she? Who was she? Her name is Terai Trent. Listen to this story. I'm gonna try to shorten it for you, Please Godfrey. Do. Okay. Terai Trent, born and raised in a village in Zimbabwe. 11 years old, she's doing her brother's homework. She wants to go to school, her father says no. You have, to, you have to educate the boy first. Yep, that's right. That was the I, tradition. That's right. The boy has to go to school. You can't go to school. So she starts doing her brother's homework. She does his her brother's homework. He goes to school. He gets all A's on his homework, yet he doesn't know the answer to the question. The teacher comes to the village to say, what is going on here? This boy doesn't know the answers, but his homework's perfect. She finds out that Terai, his younger sister, is doing his homework. She begs the father to let Terai go to school. The father says, no, she can't go to school. Finally, he marries her off. She marries at 11 and a half years old. She gets married. She has three children by the time she's 18 years old. A woman comes to the village from an NGO, Heifer International, and asks, what are your dreams? This is gonna make me cry. Finally, you're gonna make me cry. <laughs> asks her, what are your dreams? This child has never thought about what her dreams were. She says, write down your dreams. She writes down her dreams on a piece of paper and she folds them in a tin can and she buries them under a rock. The oh, first dream yes. was to be able to go to the school and go to a school in the United States of America and get a college degree. She ends up through some miracle 
of the NGO going to the United States. She wow. gets a college degree. Wow. Yes, she gets a four-year degree in three years. Uh -huh. Tara Trent. She goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes her next goal on the piece of paper. She buries it under the rock. She writes, I want to get a master's degree. She goes back to the United States. She gets a master's degree. By this time, she now has five children. She's married to a man who still oh, beats incredible. her. Incredible. She goes back to the United States. She gets her master's degree. After the master's degree, she goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes down her final goal is to get a doctorate degree. And last year, she became Dr. Tararai Trent. Where did you find it? Where did I find it? Um, I found her in the, in the Nicholas Kristof's book called uh, something, The Sky, Underneath the Sky or the Sky. I, Nicol, I found her in Nicholas Kristof's book. Incredible, mm -hmm. incredible. And I was reading the story. I had Nicholas Kristof on the show. Nicholas Kristof, the famous New York Times writer. And she wasn't there. She wasn't a part of the show. I'm reading the story. I can't believe this book, the story of this woman as I'm reading the story. So when we go to do the show, the producers have Nicholas Kristof on. They bring on other guests, but this woman isn't there. I go, how, how could you not have her there? So we tape another show with Nicholas Kristof. We go back, I go, fine, we're gonna find that woman, Tara Wright Trent. This time, by this time, she's living in the United States. We followed her back to Zimbabwe, to the rock. We pulled the tin can from underneath the rock. And that is my favorite guest of all time. And the worst? Um, I don't have a worst. <laughs> I don't have a worse. But the reason why she, and, and as I said this on my show, the reason why Tara Wright Trent is my favorite guest of all time is because she represents in that one story of the little girl in a village in Zimbabwe who had a dream and the heart and depth and discipline to pursue it. She represents everything I tried to say in every show in 25 years. She literally, through her life story, sums up the message that I was trying to give to every single one of my viewers. You can, you can, keep trying, don't give up. You have to believe. You have to believe. Close your eyes for a moment, will you please? And breathe with me, just close your eyes. And if you will, put your thumb to your middle finger and gather your other fingers around and let's feel the vibration and pulse of your personal energy as you take three deep breaths with me. Inhale. And as you exhale, just feel the vibration, energy, blood pulsating through your body through you. And another inhale. And another inhale. And keep your eyes closed. And let's just think about this day. This day that you have been graced to breathe in and out thousands of times. This day where many of those breaths were taken for granted. You just expected the next one to come. But the truth is there's no guarantee that the next one comes. This day, how you started your day, what your thoughts were this morning, how you've carried yourself through this day, how you've been allowed to have encounters and experiences, some challenging, some more life enhancing, that pushed you forward another day of being here on the planet Earth as a human.
being. Let's just think about that. After all you've been through, in this day alone, and the many days and years past, how you got here to this prestigious, esteemed university, the choices you made that have brought you to this day. Open your heart and quietly to yourself say the only prayer that's ever needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're still here. And you get another chance this day to do better and be better. Another chance to become more of who you were created and what you were created to fulfill. Thank you. Everything you try to do is already done. So when I figured that out, oh, what I'm putting out is what's coming back, let me get real clear about what it is I'm putting out. Real clear. So I read a book about 1989 called Seed of the Soul. And in that book, Gary Zukav talked about the laws of karma of the laws of cause and effect, the third law of motion. And in that book, he talked about how intention, your intention is always one with the law. Meaning, before you even think about a thing, you have an intention for the thing. And that the intention is going to determine the outcome. That's why the same people can go to the same church service and somebody walk down the aisle just to be seen to put some money in the church and somebody else who just goes and just has a little bit to offer. The intention with which you give the intention with which you serve determines the outcome. So when I figured that out, I went, whoa. I changed everything I did on my show. I called in the producers and I said, from this day forward, I will no longer be speaking to the KKK. I will no longer be speaking to people who are fighting each other in a way that it is damaging to the character of myself and other people who watch. From this day forward, I am only going to do intentional television. I know you all understand better than most that real progress requires authentic, an authentic way of being, honesty, and above all, empathy. I have to say, that the single most important lesson I learned in 25 years talking every single day to people was that there is a common denominator in our human experience. Most of us, I tell you, we don't want to be divided. What we want, the common denominator that I found in every single interview, is we want to be validated. We want to be understood. I've done over 30, 5,000 interviews in my career. And as soon as that camera shuts off, everyone always turns to me and inevitably in their own way asks this question, was that okay? <laughs> I heard it from President Bush. I heard it from President Obama. I've heard it from heroes and from housewives. I've heard it from victims and perpetrators of crimes. I even heard it from Beyonce and all of her Beyonce-ness. <laughs> she finishes performing, hands me the microphone and says, was that okay? <laughs> Friends and family, yours, enemies, strangers, in every argument, in every encounter, every exchange, I will tell you, they all want to know one thing. Was that okay? 
Did you hear me? Do you see me? Did what I say mean anything to you? And even though this is the college where Facebook was born, my hope is that you will try to go out and have more face-to-face -face conversations with people you may disagree with. <laughs> that you'll have the, the, the courage to look them in the eye and hear their point of view and help make sure that the speed and distance and anonymity of our world doesn't cause us to lose our ability to stand in somebody else's shoes and recognize all that we share as a people. This is imperative for you as an individual and for our success as a nation. The way to make movies is to do stuff that you love because, you know, for 25 years I worked on The Oprah Show and uh, Stedman will tell you that there were day nights that I came home and I almost, you know, it's hard to even like take off my clothes because I knew I was going to be getting up four hours later. But I never really felt exhausted, like deplete. I never I felt exhausted, but I never felt depleted. So do the work that comes straight from the soul of you from your background, from stories that you've grown up with, from stories that bring you passion, from stories that you uh, not just yearn to tell, but that if you don't tell them, they won't get told. And when you, when you are operating, you know, the single, the single greatest uh, wisdom I think I've ever received, other than when people show you who they are, is that the key to fulfillment, success, happiness, contentment in life is when you align your personality with what your soul actually came to do. I believe everybody has a soul and has, you know, their own personal spiritual energy. So when you can use your personality to serve whatever that thing is, you can't help but be successful. So if you do films that come from the interior of your soul, you do work, you do art that comes from the interior of you, it, it, you cannot miss. It's only when you're doing stuff that you think might make money, you think it may be uh, a hit, or you think it may uh, bring you some level of attention or success. That isn't what does it. I would have to say that all of the great wonderful experiences of my life that have brought me to this moment have come from working from the interior of myself. And so that's why it feels so authentic, because it, it actually is. So when you do that, you'll win. One of the things I started to get uh, around mid to late, no, no, late, mid to late 90s, is that everybody that I had on the show, at the end of the show, would say something to me like, um, was that okay? Was that okay? How was that? Was that okay? Right. At the end of the interview. And I started to then track it. It didn't matter if it was, um, I, 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 I had gone and done a show where I was in um, a prison, and I was interviewing a father who was in jail for life for murdering his twin daughters. And at the end of the interview, even behind bars, he said to me, is that okay? How'd I do? And Barack Obama said it when he sat in the chair the first time. And George Bush said it. Beyonce said it at the end of her. She taught me how to twerk and then said, is that okay? <laughs> so that's an acquired skill, do they? Right? Yes, a working thing. But this is what I learned uh, sitting in that chair for 25 years. That at the end of the day, whether you are interviewing me or I get to interview you, whatever your profession is, wherever you are in your life, in your relationships, every person that you encounter, every experience, the person wants to know, was that okay? Was that okay? And what I started to hear was that what people are really saying is, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything right. to you? And so I started to listen with that in mind, with that intention of validating that your being here, your speaking to me, your taking the time to do this with me is important because you matter. And that's true for everybody who's watching or listening, that every argument that you ever have, every encounter, 
The person just wants to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did I say anything that mattered? I went through some tough times after, after I left the Oprah show. I made a conscious decision that I did not want to be sitting on TV with the Oprah show and y'all saying, she should have left that show. That show was really good two years ago. I made a conscious decision, decision that when I felt I had said all that I could say and the audience had heard it, that I would move on and that I would not spend my life regretting or trying to hold on to what used to be or hold on to what I had. So I dreamed this dream of starting a network. And in the beginning, it was, it was a struggle. It was a struggle because I didn't, I, honest to goodness, I did not know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out. I thought that the Oprah show audience would follow us to own. And then I realized y'all didn't have cable. And if you had cable, you did not have the own package. So, so it took me a minute. And unlike most people who you get to have your mistakes in private, some don't go right in your life. You get to sulk about it in private. If I make a mistake, it's on the CNN crawl or the CNN news. So when I was in the climb and there were so many wonderful owners, I see Churl Action Jackson here. There were so many wonderful owners, people who said, oh, we're going to stand with you. We're going to stand by you. Thank you, Roland Martin. There were so many people who said, listen, we believe that this can happen. So I dreamed the dream along with Tyler Perry, who was my friend who came to me and said, Tyler, Tyler said, I'm going to help you out because Tyler can go home and write a script and direct it, produce it, and shoot it, and do it for less money than anybody in Hollywood. So we started with the foundation of have and have nots. If loving you is wrong, love thy neighbor, Mama Hattie. And then I started to dream another dream about scripted television, because in the beginning I was told you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, didn't have enough money to do it. And I dreamed the dream. I read Proverbs 11:28 that says, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will rise and thrive like a green leaf. I first started making money and it was, you know, my salary or my earnings were published all over the place. I mean, the first year I was like, really? Did I make that much money? Oh my God. Um, it, it was very difficult for me to figure out where my boundaries were because I'd grown up poor and didn't have anything. So it's easy when you don't have anything and people ask you for money. And they say, I need 500. You say, I don't have it because I'm just trying to get my rent paid. It's harder when your multi-billion dollar salary is now in the paper and you get a lot of friends and cousins you didn't have before. So how do you set boundaries for yourself? I was having trouble setting boundaries myself for myself for even strangers. People would just show up at my door in Chicago and say, Oprah, I left my husband, please help me. And I would because she knows I have it. So. Don't try that now though, okay? <laughs> Don't try that now, I figured it out. <laughs> so what I learned was is that, oh, the reason why people keep showing up is because my intention is to make them think that I'm such a nice person that you can ask me for anything, you can get me to do anything, I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna say yes. So when Stevie called me this time, I thought I'd try out my first no on Stevie. Let's start big. <laughs> he wanted me to donate some money to a charity and I didn't want to donate to the charity because I have my own charities and I care about a lot of people but the, the, the problem is when you, you have money, everybody thinks you just want to give to everything. So every letter I ever get starts with, we know you love the children. <laughs> yes, I do love the children but somebody else is going to have to help the children. So I said to Stevie, uh, I said to Stevie, no. And um, 
as a person who has that disease to please, I was waiting for him then to, to say, I will never speak to you again. I will never call you. I will never sing a song for you. And he didn't. He just said, okay. Okay? Okay, it's okay? He said, okay, check you later. And what I learned from that is, many times you will have angst and worry about things and put yourself in a state, like someone said this morning because their phone went off, they were mortified over a phone, I said, really? Um, you will put yourself in a state when the other person really isn't even thinking about you. So learning that I could specifically determine for myself what the boundaries were for me, what I wanted to do, give my money, give my time, give of my service to who I wanted to give it to when I did, that I get to make that decision. And just because you get 100 requests a week doesn't mean you have to try to fulfill all of that. Just because you have all of these demands on your time and on you doesn't mean that you have to say yes. You get to decide because you're the master of your fate the captain of your soul, as William Ernest Henley said in Invictus. And understanding that really changed the meaning of my life in that I was not no longer driven by what other people wanted me to do, but took charge of my own destiny, making choices based upon what do I feel is the next right move for me. Everybody works hard and everybody has their own dreams. There is, there was a time where I used to spend a lot of energy wanting things, wanting things. Of course, it's easy for me to say, oh, things don't define you because I got a lot of things. Things are nice, I like them. But this is what I learned. When you can surrender to the dream, you get to live in the space of the higher power. You get to live in the space that you purposefully have come to earth to claim for yourself. So, around 1984, I was sitting in bed one morning, uh, Sunday morning, should have been in church, but I wasn't. I was reading the New York Times review of The Color Purple. And I thought, whoa, this sounds like a really great book. I got out of bed in my pajamas, put on my galoshes, and went to the store to get the copy of The Color Purple. I read The Color Purple in one afternoon, got, went back to the bookstore, bought every book of The Color Purple. I took the books to, to the office and I said to everybody, y'all gotta read this book, oh my God, you gotta read this book, Color Purple. I needed a book club, I didn't have one. Uh, so I passed out the book to everybody I knew. Please, read The Color Purple, read The Color Purple. Then I start to hear that somebody's gonna do a movie about the color purple. But I don't know anybody in the movie business. By this time, I was on AM Chicago. I don't know anybody. I start praying to God. God, please help me find a way to get into color purple. <laughs> I say, Jesus, I don't even have to have a speaking part. I will be, because I went to the movies and I saw on the movie credits, at the last credit, there's something called Best Boy. So I said, Jesus, if you just let me be best girl, that'd be all right by me. I can be best girl. I can carry the script. I can help the people with the water. I can do whatever. So I start praying for the color purple. As, as divine law would have it, Quincy Jones comes to Chicago and he is in Chicago for one half of a day because somebody has filed a suit against Michael Jackson claiming that Billie Jean was their lover and that's not his song. <laughs> so Quincy had taken the red eye to Chicago. He was in his hotel room. He was coming out of the shower and the television in his hotel room is on AM Chicago. There sits little chubby me with my Jerry Curl on AM Chicago. Quincy Jones tells Reuben Cannon, the casting agent, I think I found 
Sophia. So I get a call from Ruben Cannon who says, I'm calling about a movie. It's called Moon Song. Would you be interested to come and audition? And I say, I have not been praying for Moon Song. No. I had not been playing for Moon Song. I've been praying for the color purple. He said, Well, I think you should come and, and, and audition. So I go to audition. You know, movie people, they're making everything all secret. Steven Spielberg didn't want anybody to know he was doing color purple. So on the outside of the script, it says Moon Song. But I know all the words by heart. So when I open the script, I know this is the color purple Jesus. This is the color purple. Yes. So I auditioned for the color purple. I can't even believe it. They don't just want me to be the water girl or the best girl. They are asking me, do I want a part in the movie? Oh, that, that, I'm thinking prayer. Prayer works. Prayer works. But listen to this. Three months pass. Three months is a long time. I auditioned in February. March, April, May comes. I haven't heard anything. So I call Reuben Cannon. I say, Mr. Cannon, I'm sorry, sir. I haven't heard anything. I expected to hear something by now. And Reuben Cannon, African-American man, says to me, you don't call me. I call you. And I didn't call you. Do you understand that I have real actresses who have auditioned for this part? Real actresses. And he tells me who just left his office and I went, well, okay, I'm not getting that part. So I hang up the phone and I start crying. I can't believe that God has played this trick on me. I think, this is a trick. So I decide that this is because the fat has finally caught up with me. The fat has finally caught up with me and now I must get rid of the fat in two weeks. I am going to go to a fat farm and I'm going to lose 25 pounds. I'm going to drink a lot of green juice. I'm going to have some cleanses and colonics. So I... I, I also was trying to make peace with it. I said, God, I don't understand. I thought it was for me. You ever had that talk with God? I, I, I thought it was for me. I thought it was for me. God, you let me audition with somebody named Harpo. That's my name backwards. Jesus, that was a sign. Wasn't it a sign? And then three months pass, and then, then Reuben Cannon says, real actresses have just left his office. So I start to pray on the track. I'm out on the track at the fat farm, and I am running around at the track at the fat farm. It starts to rain. Y'all know how that is. But I don't even care because I am praying to God to help me to let it go. Help me let it go because now I've become obsessed with it and it's now controlling my life. I start praying, running around the track. And I keep hearing this noise and I... I can't, there's nobody on the track but me, and I'm running around the track. And I look around, and it is my thighs rubbing together. It's my thighs. My thighs are rubbing together causing this thunderous sound. There's nobody on the track. So then I really start to cry. Oh, Lord, help me. 
Help me let it go. Help me let it go. Help me let it go, God. Help me let it go. And you ever did this prayer where you say, okay, Lord, okay, I'm gonna let it go. Then you get up and you go, well, I think I still got a little bit of it. I did. Help me let it go, but I am not gonna be able to see the other actress in my part. I won't be able to see it. I won't be able to see Color Purple. Just can't never see it the rest of my life. I won't be able to see it. So then I started... I don't know where it came from. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I sang and I cried. I sang and I cried and I prayed some more until... I could reach the point where not only, not only will I be able to go to the movie, but I can bless the other actress. I can bless her. I can say, I bless you. I bless you. I bless you with this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my Blessed Savior, I surrender all. And I tell you in my greatest testimony that the instant I laid that thing down, I'm telling you, when I laid it down, when I laid it down and it didn't have me anymore. It had no control over me anymore. I didn't feel anything about it anymore. When I let it go, when I intentionally surrendered it to the power that was greater than I could ever know. The instant that happened, a woman comes running out of the cafeteria screaming, Ofri? Is your name Ofri? For 10 years, nobody could pronounce my name. I said, yeah. She said, somebody's on the telephone for you. He said, name Spielberg. I get to the phone. He says, I hear you're at a fat farm. I said, no, sir. This is a health retreat. He says, I'd like to see you in my office in California tomorrow. This, is, this was in Wisconsin, I was. I'd like to see you in my office. And if you lose a pound, you could lose this part. No problem do I have. I'll have no problem not losing a pound. So, honey, I packed my bags and I stopped at the Dairy Queen. I got three scoops just in case I'd lost half a pound. <laughs> and the next day I was in Steven Spielberg's office and he said, you're hired, you're hired. My television career began unexpectedly. Uh, as you heard this morning, I was in the Miss Fire Prevention Contest. That was when I was 16 years old in Nashville, Tennessee and you had the requirement of having to have red hair in order to win up until the year that I entered. So they were doing the question and answer period because I knew I wasn't gonna win in the swimsuit competition. So during the question and answer period, the question came, why young lady, what would you like to be when you grow up? And by the time they got to me, all the good answers were gone. 
So I had seen Barbara Walters on the Today Show that morning, so I answered, I would like to be a journalist. I would like to tell other people's stories in a way that makes a difference in their lives and the world. And as those words were coming out of my mouth, I went, whoa, this is pretty good. I would like to be a journalist. I want to make a difference. Well, I was on television by the time I was 19 years old. And in 1986, I launched my own television show with a relentless determination to succeed. At first, I was nervous about the competition, and then I became my own competition, raising the bar every year, pushing, pushing, pushing myself as hard as I knew. Sound familiar to anybody here? Eventually, we did make it to the top, and we stayed there for 25 years. The Oprah Winfrey Show was number one in our time slot for 21 years. And I have to tell you, I became pretty comfortable with that level of success. If you want another awesome video in our Black Excellence series, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there.